those questions at the end. So we'll have plenty of time for questions. And we are recording. Um, and this presentation will also be available on our website shortly after the meeting today. Um, so PCEC is, we're your community conservation group. We've got uh, a little bit more than 650 contributing members here in Park County and over 3,000 supporters. We work with people here to safeguard the land, water, wildlife, and communities in Yellowstone's Northern Gateway. We do that through grassroots organizing, education, and advocacy. Park County is the traditional homeland and the current home to many indigenous people, including the Apsaloka or Crow tribe, and Park County today has a long tradition of human habitation, of people that have loved, cherished, and stewarded this place. We're committed to working together to honor this legacy and this place for future generations. We've been hosting these Zoom conversations about growth and planning in our community for the past several years. And our goal is to help us all learn and gain a shared understanding about some of the most pressing issues we face as a community so that we can be more knowledgeable and more prepared to advocate together for this place. So you may be wondering why a grassroots conservation group cares about housing. Well, we believe that taking care of people in our community is central to our mission and our values. And we believe that people need safe and affordable housing in order for our community to thrive. And we believe that learning to grow together we can create thoughtful development that consolidates growth in our urban footprints, and that that's good for our human communities and our non-human community members. And ultimately, I don't think we can do conservation in this community if we don't work together on housing. Um, while some people might think that no growth is the best approach, we don't think that that's realistic or equitable. Uh, we have been seeing more and more people moving to our community because it's an incredible place. We have access to natural amenities, public lands, the Yellowstone River and Yellowstone National Park. We're seeing a boom in both recreation and residential development here. And that's a trend that's been happening for years. But in the past several years, we've seen some really shocking changes, especially in the housing market, making it harder and harder for the folks that live here to keep on living here. So we believe that we need to work together. And by doing that, we can build the vision for the community we want to become rather than letting growth happen to us. Uh, if you think that that sounds good, please go to our website, pcecmt.org. If you aren't already, you can join our mailing list there, learn more about the work that we're doing, or even better, now is a great time to become a member. Uh, we have a, a match for all donations and new memberships through the end of the year. So. Thank you so much for being here and for your interest. All right, with that intro, I'm gonna pass uh, it over to our friends and partners with HRDC. Um, HRDC is the Human Resource Development Council and uh, they have local offices that serve Gallatin Park and Mar County. Uh, over the past couple of years, HRDC has been providing Livingston and Park County with assistance, specifically addressing the complex issue of housing affordability. Um, so we're joined today by Lila um, Fleischman. She's the Community Development Program Manager and she's been with HRDC since 2019. Her focus um, is on program development and housing policy, including uh, she leads the, the work of the Park County Housing Coalition. Um, so thank you so much, Lila, for joining us again today for all of your work on behalf of our community. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Hey, thanks so much, Michelle. That was uh, such a thorough introduction. I think that I will just do two things and then hand it over to our guest speakers with Trust Montana. Um, one is that I'm going to drop a link in the chat so that you can learn more about the draft housing action plan and the housing working group process that went into that. There's a space for feedback. There's a community needs assessment uh, where there's additional data that you can find information about why we've promoted some of those strategies. I also would like to introduce um, my fellow project manager in community development, Rita uh, Whip Ripley Weimer, or <laughs> um, she focuses a lot of our work on, on the community land trust model, working with the land development as well as um, buyers and program development, as, and she can help me answer many of your questions about what might be happening locally. So I'll save some time at the end if you have 
you know, questions for us, you can also always email us and I will turn it over to Trust Montana that operates across the entire state and can speak broadly to what other communities are doing, um, some of the options that are available to Park County and Livingston. One of the, the proposed strategies in the draft housing action plan is to expand the community land trust in Park County and Livingston. So thank you so much for uh, joining us. We have Hermina and Austin, and I don't know who was speaking first, um, but we're very excited to learn more. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having us today. Um, I'm Ermina Harold. I'm the director of Trust Montana. Um, and I brought Austin with me today because it's a little bit more fun to present with two people. Um, and we've been working really hard this year uh, to, to spread the community land trust model and across Montana and to educate a lot of professionals about the, the model. Um, so we were asked to come today to talk about the model in general and to um, look at different ways that scaling up a community land trust effort can work. And that is what all community land trusts around the country are constantly trying to do. Um, so for us, we've, we've come up with a few creative solutions um, and workarounds to make community land trust portfolios grow in Montana, which is a place that has fewer options for funding affordable housing than a lot of other states. So we're just, we're gonna give just a kind of a quick presentation about the model and some of our approaches. And then I think the best conversation happens with the question and answer section. So um, I'll let Austin take it to the next slide. Thanks, Ermina. And yeah, thanks so much for having us today. So um, when we were getting ready for this presentation, I, we just wanted to do a little check in, see how the housing market looks in Park County. And as I'm sure you all are all well aware, um, you have seen some drastic changes in your housing market in the last year where single family home prices have jumped um, to, you know, an increase by 50% uh, in the last year. Uh, your current median home price in Park County is over $400,000, uh, while income levels have pretty much stayed the same. Um, your area median income for folks for a single person is, is around $50,000. So um, this, this sort of trend, uh, the housing crisis, we're all well aware of in Montana. And um, the work, the issue really is that the workforce, the people who live and work in communities across Montana in Park County. Um, the workforce can't afford to purchase homes in Montana. And that's a really uh, scary prospect as we move forward. And we think that community land trusts provide a really exciting and interesting and creative solution to this issue. Um, because they provide home ownership opportunities for low to moderate income buyers who might qualify for a loan, um, but just can't afford to buy in the current market. So um, we, yeah, we can move on to the next slide. So what is a CLT? A you'll hear us say CLT a lot. That's just abbreviation for community land trust. Um, a community land trust is usually a nonprofit organization, although the model can be administered by municipalities or quasi-governmental entities like the HRDC. Um, and it is an, it's an organization that holds land for the benefit of the community. The model is really flexible and it can be used to hold farmland, commercial property, or even like historical properties, uh, other community assets in the trust. And usually uh, CLTs have a tripartite board so that there's representation from community members, CLT homeowners, and practitioners, you know, experts who um, have some expert knowledge uh, to serve uh, on the board. Uh, so Marina will tell you about how the model exactly works in the next slide. So the basics are that the home buyer purchases the improvements, but not the land. The land is held in trust by the community land trust or the municipality if they're running a land trust in their um, government. The CLT organization or government owns the land in fee simple and the home owner owns the home in fee simple ownership and has a leasehold right to the land. 
Um, a long-term ground lease outlines those rights and obligations of both parties. Um, the home buyer has the right to occupy and use the land, but they agree to keep it well-maintained and they agree to restrict their equity over time in that ground lease. Um, and everybody who enters into a ground lease is required to review it with an attorney to make sure that they understand what they're getting into. Um, it is kind of a long document. Usually they're about 30 to 40 pages. Um, so it's important that everybody understands what they're you know, entering into. Um, go ahead to the next slide. And it's always good to just review the difference between land trust types. Um, we get a lot of people calling us some, for uh, conservation land trust issues and we don't really uh, preserve uh, open space, although we can with our model if, if the open space is something that the community wants and wants to make uh, accessible to the, to the community and affordable. Um, but in general, the difference is just that um, community land trust preserve the community assets for the needs of a specific community and usually that's affordability related. Um, and the conservation land trust usually focuses on preserving wildlife habitat, open space or recreational access. Um, we own land and use the ground lease as our legal mechanism to restrict what happens with the land whereas the conservation land trust usually puts an easement on the land to restrict what the land is used for. So those are the basic differences. Um, and I'll pass it back to Austin. Jen, you can go on to the next slide. Thank you. So um, the CLT takes the cost of the land out of the home's purchase price and usually invests subsidy into the home as well, which brings the purchase price down to an affordable rate. Um, home buyers can also take advantage of additional subsidy to lower the purchase price of the home, like down payment assistance, um, et cetera. And the terms of the ground lease ensure that the subsidy isn't lost on resale and instead serves multiple households over time. And this is really why the model is so awesome um, because it keeps homes permanently affordable. And uh, once a home comes into a community land trust, it's really captured there and it, maintain, it maintains its affordability over time through the restrictions outlined in the ground lease. And Hermina will go over those restrictions in, uh, I think, the next slide. But uh, I just really want to reiterate that homeowners enjoy all the benefits of home ownership, um, but there, but because it's like a stepping stone out of the rental market, there are certain restrictions that ensures that the home isn't just like flipped and resold and sent back out onto the you know regular real estate market because then that, you know, that totally defeats the purpose of you know, maintaining affordability and ensuring that the home serves home buyer after home buyer. Um, so Amina can take the next slide. So the basic homeowner restrictions are related to resale price, um, which is limited by a formula. Um, HRDC and Trust Montana have different formulas. Every community land trust in the state uses their own formula. Um, ours is a simple interest formula. Um, so it restricts that the resale can only happen to other income qualified buyers in the future. Um, and that the homeowner has to use the, the home as their primary residence. And the CLT also retains a right of first refusal in case there's ever a foreclosure or there's a situation where we wanna buy the home back and fix it up, we, we always have that right to save the home and make sure that it stays permanently affordable. Um, the benefits, some of the benefits are just that the homeowner gets to own a home, of course. Um, usually this model is the most useful for people who are otherwise stuck in the rental market. Um, there's a reduced purchase price. Um, they receive homeowner education and they have stable housing costs. Um, I'm a renter and I am always waiting for my, my rent to go up. And I know a lot of people are dealing with that in Montana right now. Um, the long-term long -term stewardship is super important. That's a big part of what the community land trust organization does. So we have a stewardship coordinator on staff that supports the homeowners long-term 
helps them with any issues they come up with. Uh, if they if they hurt, they get financial issues, they can help them get out of those situations or purchase the home back if they need to to help somebody get out of a bad situation. Um, they realize limited equity growth, um, so they can earn equity instead of paying a landlord. Um, and then they can devise their home to an heir in the future. Um, and this is a good moment to ask if there are any questions. And it looks like there was one question. Do trailers or prefab homes included, included in the $400,000 in the definition of home? So I think the question is, relating to, we don't usually put um, trailers or mobile home park, mobile homes on community land trust land, just because they're not usually considered real property. They're considered personal property. Um, and so we don't usually use the land trust tool for that uh, type of housing. Um, usually there needs to be a foundation. It needs to be able to have a conventional loan. I don't know if that answers that question, but you can ask again if, if that didn't answer it. Um, can the land trust use cluster housing with open conservation areas as part of the development? Absolutely. There's no reason that that wouldn't work. Um, we're looking at doing that in Missoula right now with a, a farm that's got amazing soil that is a super active farm in the community. Um, and in order to save that farm, they are talking about putting some condos along the edge to help the, the current farmers purchase it and keep it in, in farmland pr um, production. So. Any other questions anyone wants to throw out specifically about what we've gone over so far? Okay, cool. Um, so I'm gonna pass it back. Oh, it's it's still me. Never mind. Um, so the benefits of the um, CLT model for homeowners. Um, they are stepping out of the rental market and into an earning equity situation. So they're going to own their home. They can fix it up if they like. They earn equity over time. Um, they do build wealth. So I said that our simple interest formula is in our ground lease. This is just an example of that. That's 1.5% per annum simple interest. This kind of goes through the basic math. So over seven years, a person who purchases the home for $200,000 can earn $20,000 in equity on top of whatever they're already paying down on their mortgage. Um, so that's much better than paying around $100,000 over the same time period for rent that you never get back. Um, the CLT stewardship supports the homeowners. Um, and uh, uh, on a national level, six out of 10 CLT homeowners use their equity from selling their CL CLT home to purchase a market rate home. So that's beautiful. And we do have a testimonial here that if there's time, we'll, we'll show you if everyone's interested in watching it. It's a pretty quick testimonial, um, but we can talk about that at the end. Um, and I will pass it back to Austin. So we think it's always uh, important to just hit on the history of community land trusts in the United States. Um, they were born out of a civil rights era effort to establish a new form of land tenure ownership for black farmers and their families. And since that time, the model has really grown across the nation. Uh, there are over 290 CLTs in 45 states and the District of Columbia. And in Montana alone, we have six community land trusts that are just doing excellent work across the state. Uh, the NMCDC is in Missoula, that's the oldest CLT. The Northwest Montana CLT is up in Kalispell. Uh, HRDC, of course, in Bozeman and serving uh, Gallatin County and beyond. Uh, the Big Sky Community Housing Trust. Uh, and then there's the Headwater CLT, which is a pretty brand new CLT in Bozeman. And then of course, Trust Montana, we are the state's statewide uh, community land trust. And our organization was really founded with the goal of helping to promote community land trust in the state. So doing our outreach work um, and our education training to key stakeholders across the state and to also support more rural communities in Montana who might not have the capacity to start up their own community land trust because uh, it is, you know, it's a fully functioning nonprofit organization and some smaller communities just don't have the capacity to do the stewardship 
to, to have that stewardship role so we can really fill that gap and also just support the other community land trust as we, as we can. Um, so we can go ahead to the next slide. So there's just great long-term potential, as we've mentioned, um, in, in using the model that over a 50 year period, one community land trust home can serve seven families over time. And uh, six out of 10 CLT homeowners use their earned equity that they've earned over time to purchase a traditional market rate home down the line. Um, and over 99% of community land trust homeowners because of that ongoing stewardship component and the home buyer education and all the other um, support systems that are really entrenched in the model, 99% um, of CLT homeowners avoid foreclosure. And then um, seven out of 10 CLT homeowners are first time home buyers. So um, we really do see the model as a stepping stone out of the rental market. Uh, it can help people just secure their, you know, financial well-being in all these ways that we've mentioned, um, and then go on to sell their CLT home and then purchase a market rate home if they want to, or they can just stay in their CLT home and put it in their will for their kids, and that family is secure for, you know, for maybe multiple generations. I'll pass it back to Hermina. Oh, wait, no, I think I'm talking about Montana. Aha, I'm going to talk about Montana Street Homes. Here we go. <laughs> so we wanted to just give you an example of a project that Trust Montana has completed. Um, it's, we call them Montana Street Homes. They're in Missoula. And these six small homes um, were designed uh, to be efficient and just awesome. They're not quite tiny homes, but they're smaller homes. They, um, there are six of them in this, in this little neighborhood um, in downtown Missoula, and they hit the market in 2019. Um, it was a partnership uh, between Homeward, the Missoula Food Bank, Garden City Harvest, and Trust Montana, and Ermina will talk more about how that partnership was developed and came to be. Um, so these prices here, I think, are pretty incredible. Uh, the one bedroom sold for um, 98,000, and the 500 square foot two bedroom sold for $120,000. So I don't know if there's a single home on the market in Montana for those prices right now. Um, and when those current homeowners who own those homes eventually go on to sell them, they will bump up in price a little bit, but they'll still be in that affordable price range. Uh, these homes were sold to households earning 80% or less of area meeting income in Missoula. And um, they're just, it's just an awesome little community um, that we're really excited to have, uh, to be a part of. We are the Community Land Trust, of course, in that partnership and Homeward was the uh, builder developer. So I'll pass it to Ramina to tell you more about how the project came to be. Yeah, so if you can go to the next slide. Um, so um, this whole project was actually spearheaded by the Missoula Food Bank and Community Center. Um, they had a new, a new food bank building and they noticed there was a piece of land right across the alley that was perfect for uh, real estate development. And they knew that, that the number one issue for most of their clients at the food bank that was causing their clients to come to the food bank was housing costs. Um, and so they reached out to different developers in the community and eventually got Homeward on board to develop the project. And Homeward had just purchased a bunch of uh, small homes from HRDC um, that they wanted to use that had been um, untouched homes from the Bakken oil boom that were um, needed to be placed somewhere in Montana um, that are really cute and came fully furnished. So um, Homeward worked on the homes. They didn't build them straight, straight from scratch, of course, but they did make them look really cute, as you can see. Um, and they worked on the efficiency um, of the homes and placed them on this interesting shape. It was like kind of a little triangle with an irrigation ditch that goes through it, um, it uh, land. So. After the construction of the homes, Trust Montana took ownership of just the land while the home buyers purchased the structures at a discounted price. 
And that was discounted because Homeward was able to bring in subsidy like home funding. And they also had brownfields for cleaning up the land and some other, other grants. Um, Homeward doesn't generally like to do home ownership projects and steward them long term. So they brought Trust Montana in to do that part. And we're not a developer. So it worked really well. Um, and we took on the land and the home buyers have been living in those homes since 2018 and 2019 when they started purchasing them. There's also a community garden on the land that we own um, and that is uh, used by the Missoula Food Bank for free. They just have a long-term lease with us and they, they grow food and have educational programs with that garden. So um, that's just one way that some of these projects can come out come about in the community. Um, and I will ask you to go to the next slide. Um, so we wanted to overview, kind of look over the, the basic components of what can make a CLT project happen. This is basic stuff, but it's important to think about. Um, so the basic components, of course, we need a developer, somebody who's ready to build homes. We need land and we need subsidy. Um, with the permanent affordability, the, there's a really good argument for permanent affordability, and that is that it's really difficult to find subsidy um, and to get enough subsidy to actually buy the purchase prices down enough that people can afford them. And so we often use home and CDBG in the community land trust world. TIF funds are used. And then I'm going to do a special shout out right now because I just got off the phone with a national community land trust network. Um, meeting and they are really pushing for the Build Back Better bill to include specific community land trust funding. There's a set aside that I believe is around $10 billion nationally that would be available for communities like ours to apply for subsidy that's never been available before. And what they're saying right now is that John Tester is one of the people on the fence in the Senate about this bill and including community land trust specific funding. So if you know John Tester, or if you know anyone who works with him on a regular basis, we'll be reaching out to him over the next week to try to make sure that he supports the, the CLT specific funding that should be in this bill. And that could be a game changer for Montana and for everyone that's doing community land trust work around the country. So, and uh, I will try to share information about that with anyone on this call if you're interested. Um, there are also private and local municipal investments that can happen like a housing trust fund or bond, housing bonds can be passed. Um, and then any other funding that's specific to your community that is available through the government, of course, is a wonderful thing to, to put into a permanent affordable, for permanently affordable project. Um, you also need a community land trust organization in order to ensure the long-term affordability. So they need to oversee resales and make sure that um, people are taking care of their homes and that people are succeeding at home ownership. Um, so that community land trust organization is super important. Um, and it's one of the reasons that ground leases are considered to be a lot more effective uh, than deed restrictions, which uh, don't necessarily have an entity that's required to oversee them. And often deed restrictions um, don't last as long. So. Um, I'm going to go ahead and send it back to Austin, I believe. Oh, actually, you know what? That's my slide again. So sorry, go ahead to the next slide. <laughs> so we wanted to talk about the resources that um, Livingston and Park County in general have that could leverage more CLT homes. Um, I We already work in Livingston just a little bit. We um, partnered with Habitat for Humanity of Gallatin Valley. And so we hold one home in Livingston in trust and we are stewarding that home that was built by Habitat. Um, HRDC of course already works in the area. Um, and I don't know what Habitat for Humanity of Gallatin Valley still ha um, has it, um, planned for the future in Livingston or Park County, but I think that they are working in that area. Um, so you have Trust Montana support, of course, if there are projects we can partner on. And then this council, and I threw out the other because I am not super familiar with Livingston, and I think that's going to be part of our conversation today. What other organizations are there that you guys could be partnering with to try to come up with creative solutions to the housing issue? Um, grants administrators, of course, at the city or county level can be extremely helpful. 
To give an example, um, we've partnered with uh, Missoula County Grants Administrators to apply for HUD funding from Montana Department of Commerce. And we started a new um, buyer initiated community land trust pilot program in Missoula County. And what that does is it provides up to $90,000 in HUD funding per home buyer and down payment assistance. Um, and that helps people buy a regular home on the market and transition it into a community land trust home. And so that means that we don't have to do all of the lengthy building processes and permitting um, we just invest a big chunk of funds into an existing home and turn that home into a permanently affordable home. So that's something that could be um, supported by a grants administrator at your county level or your city level. Um, housing trust fund, as I mentioned before, is a wonderful thing that a city or county can do to support housing. Um, if there is municipal land available for building homes, that is something that the city of Missoula and the county are looking at um, providing um to the affordable housing nonprofits in this area um private business support is becoming a bigger issue because i think a lot of uh, businesses are feeling the issue of not having um housing for their workforce and so are struggling and so i think it's a really important thing to reach out to local businesses um, and see if they're willing to invest in this issue um, of course there's citizen support as a land trust, we have um, received land donations from individuals that are then able to be turned into permanently affordable community land trust projects. And so it's important for people to know that they can get a tax write off if they do that. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's all we wanted to go over today with before questions. And I don't wanna take up too much more time because I think I see a lot of questions popping up. Um, so yeah, let's open it up for, um, for questions however you want me to do it. I could read some or you guys can ask ask me directly. Maybe just pulling from the chat, um, we'll start with Wendy's question. I think that was the one right after our last question session. She asked how many homes are in trust right now in Montana? I don't know that exact number, Mina, do you? I think it's just under 150 uh, total at this point. Yep. Um, that's between, you know, Big Sky has over 50, the Kalispell has over 50, Missoula has over 50. Um, wait, so that means more than 150 now. Yeah, yeah. I can yeah. do math. <laughs> <laughs> and then Thomas asked, how does the CLT fund the acquisition of a property? That is a great question, Thomas. <laughs> yeah, so that that is where we get really creative. Um, in the case of Trust Montana, we've um, we've got this new program where we're bringing ninety thousand dollars, which helps purchase the land and part of the value of the home. Um, with other land trusts, they are using uh, grant funding, and then we have received a lot of land donations from other nonprofits, just because they're already investing the funds to make the homes affordable, and then they see it as an investment to have us take over the land because we're taking over that 75 plus years of work in stewarding the affordability so they don't have to do it. Um, so we are getting donations from other nonprofits pretty often, including um, Habitat Affiliates and Homeward. Um, but in other states, they have housing trust funds uh, that help purchase land. Um, and then they have other grants that are available that are funded by things like real estate transfer tax, which we, we can't have in Montana. Um, and then there's inclusionary zoning, which we also can't have in Montana now. So we're getting more and more creative as we as we go. Yeah, one other funding stream I like to mention is that um, the Northwest Montana CLT up in Kalispell, they received, they applied for and received neighborhood stabilization funds. So they were able to go and purchase market rate homes that were in pretty dire need of repair, um, kind of after the housing fallout in 2008, 2009. Um, and so they were able to go purchase market rate homes, put them into the land trust, pump some more subsidy into the home to bring it down to an affordable rate. And that's how they were able to capture um, over 50 homes in the flathead and put them into their portfolio. So just lots of creative, solutions um, and ideas for how to get how to get land because that's really the 
that's the basis of any CLT project is just figuring out where the land comes from. So the next question is from Sandra. She asks um, your thoughts on workforce deed restriction for purchase of affordable housing. So you, Romina, you kind of mentioned um, what you think about deed restrictions, um, but maybe expand on that a little bit. So um, I'm not an attorney, but my understanding of the legal differences are that deed restrictions are just not quite as strong as a legal mechanism um, because there isn't an entity that is required to oversee those resale restrictions. And I think deed restrictions can be really good if that's your only option, but I think generally we, the ground lease is considered to be a stronger um, tool. Um, and it's harder for the title companies at a resale to accidentally overlook that there's a ground lease in place. Um, but like I said, I'm not, a, I'm not an attorney, but um, Austin is, so she might have other thoughts she could add. No, I think you nailed it, Armina. I think it's just a less, um, yeah, it's not as strong of a, of a document, but um, I'm pretty sure that the, there are community land trusts who absolutely use deed restrictions. There's, um, I think Big Sky Housing Trust does use deed restrictions. I could be wrong there, but I'm pretty sure that they do. <laughs> Um, so it's just whatever creative way you want to, you want to put those, um, restrictions on your homeowners, um, they can work. We definitely prefer the ground lease at Trust Montana. Um, so we have another question who determines the designs of the homes, um, Trust Montana, we're not a builder developer. So we partner with developers who have design expertise. Um, so when we partner with Habitat for Humanity, they do the architecture design and development of the actual homes. Our other projects with Homeward, their, their design team um, designs the home. So usually it's for us, it's, a, it's a, usually a three-part partnership um, with, with organizations who have that design expertise. Um, and then Ken asks, single families, or says, it's more of a comment, single family standalone homes are not the solution for Park County. And we're seeing that in other uh, communities too across the state. Does the CLT work with multifamily condo housing? Yes, so we do. Um, often we work with townhome exemption developments at Trust Montana. We, we're doing, uh, Montana Street Homes was actually a townhome exemption development. Um, and we are also doing one in Red Lodge right now. Um, and they work really well in most communities. I, there are some communities that don't allow TEDs to happen in the right in the way that we would need them to happen for a community land trust. Um, but condos are also a possibility. There are condo community land trusts in Missoula and in Big Sky. Um, so yes, absolutely, that's important to do. And we're also looking at doing cooperative community land trusts uh, by working with Montana Cooperative Development Center. And Anne, thank you for, she says, happy to call Senator Tester's office. I will um, share our Facebook page and our Instagram. If you could give those a follow, we will be posting some talking points today um, that you can copy paste in an email or call um, Senator Tester. So thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Anne. Let's see. Looks like there's a question for someone in Livingston who knows about the Sherwood Apartments. So I, I don't know how to answer that one, but. Either. Um, oh, looks like they were, they answered it in the chat. Sorry. Great. Um, so does the land trust pay taxes and insurance? Good question. The home buyer pays uh, taxes on the home and the uh, land trust can put the land into tax exempt status if the community desires that to happen. We have a mix in Trust Montana. Some of our partners have wanted to keep everything in the tax base, whereas others have asked us to apply for tax exemption. In the case of the land being in the tax space still, the home buyer is responsible for paying both the, the taxes on the land and the house. Um, I can read this out loud. Um, 
there is a significant amount of land east of the Livingston shops that was condemned because of the carcinogenic plume now available for brownfield development and CLG. Sorry, what is CLG? I'm not sure. Maybe that was a typo, CLT maybe? Okay. Oh, right. Um, are tiny homes considered homeland and not modular homes? Uh, yes, the, so, the, so the small homes at Montana Street are considered uh, regular um, homes. Uh, they do have conventional lending available for them. Um, lack of planning. Cool, and I don't think I can answer any of the, the other questions in that um, paragraph, but if anyone else can, please feel free to speak up. And then Jonathan asks, what's the best way for a community like Park County to move forward? Does it make sense to work with established partners or to develop a local land trust? Great that, question. excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm I think sure. it really depends on, you know, how many homes you're looking to, to try to develop. Like the reason that Trust Montana exists is so that we can serve communities that don't necessarily have the capacity to start a standalone land trust. Um, and sometimes it doesn't make sense to start a new land trust if you're only going to have, you know, 30 homes uh, total over the years because it's not sustainable. You, you need to get to an economy of scale in order to actually have the ground lease fees uh, supporting the operations of the organization. And so part of our goal is to reach an economy of scale so that we can serve as many communities in Montana as are needed to be served. Um, so I would say you, you do have HRDC, which is wonderful. And then you have Trust Montana as a backup if you ever need support in that way. Um, we are totally willing to come in and, and work on projects in the area and hold the land. Um, but of course we're not a developer. Um, so that's why we often partner with developers like the Habitat affiliates in the state. Um, but that's a good question. And I think it's something that the, you know, the community should look at as far as like how many properties you think you're really gonna hold in the community in, in a land trust situation. I'll go ahead and jump in as well. And thanks so much for sharing all of your knowledge and um, the perspective of what's happening across the state and nationally. I think that one of the really um, important things when we look at what we wanna do in Park County is you know, to look look at all of the options. So I really appreciate um, hearing the, what's happening around the state in addition to what HRDC is currently doing. But I would like to invite Rita to share a little bit about what HRDC has been doing in the region as well as in Park County. Um, that being said, it doesn't mean that this is the only solution. When HRDC worked with the community in Big Sky um, around creating and then it being an independent organization for the Big Sky Community Housing Trust. That was an outcome of the housing action plan, but it doesn't need to look the same in every community. Um, HRDC also worked with Headwaters Community Housing Trust and other partners where that was a good solution to have another one, but we don't need to create a new organization to be able to use this model. It's an option on the table, but it's not required. So. Um, Rita, do you want to talk a little bit about some of our recent projects as well as what we have in Park County? Sure, yeah. Um, so two of the biggest projects that I've been working through since my since starting with the HRDC, one is um, the development of the Meadowview um, Community Land Trust in Big Sky, and that is now under um, Big Sky Community Housing Trust. However, um, we did do the development, HRDC did the, the development of the land trust, which is um, 52 homes. The way, and I just wanted to kind of highlight and go back to um, how do we purchase land for the community land trust. And with Big Sky, because we kind of do different things for each project and it's, that's what's interesting about him is that in Big Sky, we utilized um, the resort tax funding 
the resort tax board there worked with us to um, purchase the land. They donated the funds to purchase the land from the resort tax. So that was kind of cool. And then um, with Willow Springs, our newest land trust that is in Bozeman, we actually did um, use funds from the Neighborhood Stabilization Project. And what we did was originally we had Neighborhood Stabilization Project funding for the West Edge condos where um, I think it was 2011, we purchased those condos and then um, completed the construction and sold them with NSP funding. And then we used the program income from that project to invest in this new development for our new land trust at Willow Springs. So that was, and that created 24 new homes. So it was just kind of interesting, different ways of funding the purchase of the land. And then um, in Livingston, yes, we did have, we have a land trust in Livingston as well. It's 14 homes. The land there was actually donated. So as you can see, it's kind of a smorgasbord of how do we do this? <laughs> we come up with new interesting solutions each time. Um, but yeah, if, is there anything in spe specifically that I didn't touch on, Myla, that you'd like me to kind of recap? No, I think so. We, that's the main part. We have 14 um, homes that are, do you remember the year that we built those ones? It's, those are a little bit older. And then what kind of muddies the water is that since HRDC owned the land with these homes uh, for sale, it was called the um, Livingston Land Trust. We also put some of the same as the Missoula Street homes, those ones that um, are now for rent on the land there as well. So I would just add that although they're still part of the Livingston Land Trust and for rent, that's not the typical model. Um, that was what we had the opportunity to do and uh, to be able to add more housing. We put those additional homes on the land and are renting them, but they're not following this model that we're talking about today of home ownership. Uh, we also have leveraged more of a scattered site approach in some of our communities, Livingston included. We have a duplex as well as um, the option to kind of expand scattered site. So that kind of speaks to the, the typology question we had earlier. Uh, we have found for financing that the townhomes were a lot easier than condos. So, you know, those kind of little details that maybe make a, a larger difference when you're trying to actually get the loan than you would think about at the beginning. But the scattered site is a good way to include single family homes as well as um, new development. I think that there's a lot of options of what could be the right fit. And I wouldn't eliminate single family as an option uh, for Livingston. Do other people have questions? Um, let's see, I wasn't actually involved with the community partnership around the tree planting, but I know that that was something that our, our construction manager actually dealt with some community partners and I would love to credit the organization, but I'm not sure of who it was. Rita, do you know? It was a, a lovely community partnership. I believe we also have had some partners approach us about solar panels. So we're, we're definitely open to additional improvements. Um, and if I can think of, if anyone knows the name of the organization that worked on the tree planting, um, feel free to put that in the chat. Yeah, I am unsure about that. I know that there was another organization that had volunteered to help paint. Mm. Not 100% sure who that was either because they work directly with Martin, our land project. If we don't have more questions, we can introduce next the next community conversation and remind people about that. Uh, Michelle, let's just make sure, did we um, answer Jesse Wilcox's question? Lila, did we get that one? 
And this is Jesse. Sorry, I'm so slow at getting my buttons <laughs> off here. Um, I don't know. I was just trying to like brainstorm what Jonathan was asking, you know, where do they go next? And I guess I was just thinking about what I was envisioning for next steps for the community. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of organizations currently that are really interested in how they can contribute, but there's just no... Um, uh, like entity out there soliciting that I know of, I guess I should say. So this is just sort of me troubleshooting here. Um, but I, I was thinking that the Housing Action Coalition that sort of works on these uh, assessments, needs assessment and the action plan, are, I was hoping they were gonna sort of take the reins moving on from here and start soliciting some of these potential partnerships um, within our community um, and just see who starts to bite. Um, that seems to work pretty well in a lot of the collaborative work that I work on here. And I guess what I was maybe confused about also is in Jonathan's question, he says, you know, does it make sense to work with community partners or develop a local land trust? And now I think I'm getting confused. Is a local land trust different than a community land trust? Um, I was thinking of a community land trust is actually an organization like HRDC or Trust Montana, who would uh, manage the the the, the uh, transfer of property, et cetera, et cetera, and and so now I'm thinking I'm getting confused about Jonathan's question: Is that an and or or is that would would that be one of the partnerships that would work with local agencies to move this stuff forward? If that made sense. Yes. I guess oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, you want to go? <laughs> No, that's okay. I just, I was thinking that the way I understood the question was, does it make sense for Park County to create its own community land trust? That's a real localized, oh my gosh, the lights always turn off in this room. <laughs> They're motion activated. Um, okay, so the, does it make sense for Park County to establish its own community land trust or pull in HRDC as a community land trust or pull in Trust Montana? as the community land trust. And really, I think um, that's for your community to decide. Although I would suggest that you pull in one of these established organizations. The HRDC is obviously already active in the community um, and has that community land trust expertise um, or Trust Montana, we're happy to, to help out as well. Um, because it's just a huge, it's a heavy lift to start your own CLT and you, you don't really need to, you don't need to do that heavy lift when there's already organizations that are there. Um, but your point is great that, um, the housing action coalition could be a kind of driving force to move this idea forward. And to, and I would add another person that you start asking another you know group of people could be developers in your community um, start cluing them in on the community land trust model and say hey okay you've got this idea for this multifamily development why don't you put it on uh, on a CLT um, on CLT land so there's yeah, there's just a lot of different ways to tackle the problem, but um, I would suggest already leveraging these organizations who really know what they're doing and have been doing it for a long time um, to get something started in Park County. Yeah, that was great. And I, I think, Jessica, you're right on track of what we're hoping with this conversation and the other events around the draft plan is um, we want to make sure that the broader community has information about some of the content and is able to help refine that a little bit, but also think about how we're going to implement it. And something like community land trusts can include such a breadth of partners and have so many stakeholders and potential. There's, there's businesses, there's uh, community members, there's just so many people that can be touched by um, the community land trust model and the community land trust homes. It is a little bit confusing where we're using community land trust as a collection of homes, as well as the stewardship organization. But I think that we're all kind of talking about the right place. And we HRDC has a few um, 
homes, there's room for expansion. There's also room to expand the model beyond Livingston. Um, we would be happy to take any additional feedback, any additional partners to be part of that conversation and kind of stay in touch about where we go with the draft housing action plan and starting to implement that. I think that since we're so low on time, I'm gonna give it back to Michelle uh, to speak about the next session on December 8th. Just put it in the chat and I was gonna oh. put the link in there, but I, I mean, I think it's pretty quick. We just really need to thank all of you so much for your time today and for all of your incredibly important work on housing and, um, this has been really informative, uh, so thank you so much. Next week's conversation will be December 8th, same time, same place. We'll talk about vacation rentals. Um, and so I just wanna remind everybody, this is recorded. It'll be on our website, pcecmt.org backslash community conversations, plus all our previous conversations. And then Lila, will you direct folks to the housing action plan? Um, and then how folks can really the goal is to learn together and then we want public input on the draft plan right which which your Lila is gathering so you know it's, it's at your website right <laughs> or we can I'll, oh it looks like yes. uh, you dropped a bunch of links it's in the chat and Thanks. there you can find all of the relevant documents as well as the recording of the last session we posted Great. as well and I'll drop the link um, for next week's conversation. And really want to thank everybody who had really awesome participation today, really great conversation. So um, thank you all and hope you enjoy the rest of this weirdly warm and quite unweirdly windy Livingston afternoon. <laughs> Thanks so much for having us, you guys. Have a good day. Thanks. Thanks.